Welcome to Climate Plus, a DevX podcast. I'm Michael Igo, senior reporter at DevX. Every year, usually around this time, the world turns its attention to climate change and what we're doing or not doing about it. At the UN Climate Conference, or COP, negotiators get deep into the weeds on every aspect of the climate crisis. This year, it's happening in Dubai. To help make sense of this complex, critical moment, we're bringing you conversations with leading climate thinkers, activists, and experts, and asking them, can COP28 deliver? the evolution, I would say, of the articulation of the challenges amongst food system community activists has been a recognition that it requires a diversity of solutions. How do you feed a growing population on a planet with an increasingly unstable climate? It's a daunting question. It's also not a question that featured prominently on the agenda of international climate conferences. Until this year, food systems are having a moment. At COP28 in Dubai, there was a whole food systems day, a first. And more broadly, there's a big push to create stronger links between policies related to climate change and policies related to food and agriculture. That's something that Ertherin Cousin, the former head of the World Food Program, has hoped to see for a long time. And she's optimistic about the prospects for real systems change. With some big caveats. For one, the money still isn't flowing. This episode has two parts, a first course and a second course, if you will. Here's my conversation with Ertherin. Ertha, and thank you so much for being here. Uh, delighted, and thank you for the opportunity to participate. So I've got to be honest with you. When I start to think about the links between climate change and food systems, I struggle not to feel a little bit hopeless. Um, you know, you just look at sort of the, the numbers here. Food systems account for something like a third of greenhouse gas emissions. They support the incomes and livelihoods of about half the population of the planet. They're going to have to feed another billion and a half people by 2050. And yet this sector is among the most vulnerable to climate change impacts. Then you layer on top of that all this sort of enormous amount of inequity. And the picture just becomes very, very daunting to me. So maybe you could start by helping me, helping our our listeners see some opportunity here. Where um, can we take this in a hopeful direction? Let's start, Michael, by recognizing that this is this COP is the first time where food systems have been uh, made a priority alongside energy and transportation finance. That's a beginning as a recognition of the importance of food systems on the climate agenda. When we attended COP26, there was a nature day um, under which food systems was subsumed, but there was no specific day for food systems um, and the issues that you so well articulated in your question. At COP27, while food systems, there was a food day and and food systems were included on the agenda, the 50,000 word outcomes document never mentioned food systems. It mentioned agriculture once and food security once. This COP is quite different. And so the conversations that are occurring, not just in the blue zone with the private sector and civil society where government will join, but in the negotiation rooms themselves, where there are more countries discussing food systems as a part of their NDCs. Yeah, I mean, it it seems like sort of a a staggering omission from past years. But help me understand a little bit more clearly why that matters. What are the specific ways in which, 
you know, food systems advocates like yourselves can push negotiators or push on the, you know, the sort of broad array of private sector and, and civil society um, groups. Where's the, the opportunity in, in COP itself here? The, the opportunity in COP is that you have the people who can make a difference, as you just noted, not just from government, but across private sector, uh, civil society, the finance community in particular, all attending COP uh, and discussing these issues. And so the opportunity is to elbow our way into those conversations to ensure that um, not only are we talking about the sustainable, the just and sustainable transformation of the food system, but uh, that is, it is part of the outcomes, both from, as I noted, the declaration standpoint, but also from the financing and operational standpoint. Why is that important? Because as we are talking today, about 4.8% of all the climate finance dollars are invested in food systems. And we know that the, the, the work that is required to support, whether it's regenerative agriculture, sustainable livestock management, or the reduction in food loss and waste, all of those require finance. And so ensuring that we are part of that finance doc dialogue is as, criti as critical as ensuring that we are part of the substantive dialogue around the actions that will occur. And the right people are in the room to move the needle on the work that is necessary post-COP to support those activities. Let's dig into the, the financing piece a little bit. I'm glad you brought it up. Um, why is it that I think you said less than 5% of climate finance goes to food systems and, and agriculture. What's, um, what's been the obstacle to channeling more of that, albeit, you know, already um, too little climate finance overall, but, but even, even within that um, inadequate amount of money, why does so little of it go to this particular sector? Well, I, I think you start with the fact that food systems are just not as sexy uh, as, as fintech and, and transportation and energy. The returns on food systems are food systems investments are not as, as rapid and oftentimes not, unfortunately, not as high as, the, as those returns for capital investments on um, on the, some of the other sectors uh, that are that are part of the part of the climate agenda. The other issue I think is is a, is a self inflicted challenge from the food and agriculture community. For so long, our conversations around for what we should invest in to, to transform food systems have been quite contested amongst members of the community. Was it, is it livestock? Is it regenerative agriculture? Is it um, food loss and waste? And we, 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 often, we often articulated arguments that suggested that the investing in one area of the food system would support the food system's transformation that we need. And I think what's the, the evolution, I would say, of the articulation of the challenges amongst food system community activists has been a recognition that it requires a diversity of solutions. The solutions require everything from sustainable livestock management, regenerative agriculture activities, um, to uh, the, in, in, the alternative and what I like to call supplemental proteins because we will have a variety of different types of proteins that increasing consumption and production production of those proteins will result in um, the, the reduction in, in methane from, from, from livestock. We, we have an embrace of, by the entire community, the importance of reduction of food lost and waste. Uh, but And so the recognition that we need investment across all of those activities, that there is no silver bullet or heuristic in the food system for investment that will support the transformation 
for environment, human health, as well as the financial return that is required for all of the actors across the food system. And that is critical to ensuring that we can attract more capital into this space. And so much has been focused on public capital. What is the World Bank investing? And they are now committed to increasing their investments. What is the IMF committing? What are the development banks committing? But the reality is, unless we can also move more private sector capital into this space, we will not exceed that 5%, nor will we attract enough capital to support the scale up of the activities that are necessary for the food systems transformation. Climate Plus is supported by the World Bank. Back in October, World Bank President Ajay Banga called for a new vision for ending poverty on a livable planet with a focus on climate action. We cannot endure another period of emission heavy growth. We must find a way to finance a different world where our climate is protected, where pandemics are manageable if not preventable, where food is abundant and fragility and poverty are defeated. We do not suffer from a shortage of solutions. We're just paralyzed by a persistent lack of courage to pursue them. The good news is that we have solutions like these within reach and resources at our disposal to scale them. To learn more about efforts to end poverty on a livable planet, search for the World Bank Group at COP28 or click the link in the show notes. That was part one of this episode of Climate Plus. In part two, my colleague Jenny Ravello speaks to Dr. Ismahan Elawafi, the chief scientist of the Food and Agriculture Organization, about what it is that we're actually talking about when we talk about a broken food system. Here's their conversation. Help set the stage for us. Um, what our current food system looks like and why people are saying it's broken. So agri-food system, it's the whole value chain and beyond. So it's from before the production, the production per se, the processing, the storage, the, the supermarket and the consumption. So this is agri-food system. And we insist on agri because we are talking about everything we do under the agricultural definition, which include plants, animals, fisheries, forestries, and so on and so forth. So it is broken because we are not able to nourish ourselves. That's as simple as that. We have still 780 million people that go to bed hungry, we have still 3.1 billion people that cannot afford a healthy diet. Um, in my time as chief scientist of FAO, we did a lot with the indigenous people. And one of the indigenous communities told me, normally as a community in the indigenous way of doing it, they won't let anybody go hungry to bed. And the why, it's because if somebody doesn't find food, the whole community fails. So that's how they had, this is the indigenous approach to food. If we take it today, we are failing 780 million times per day because there are so many people that are not really having access to the food. And the reason behind it, there is a huge component of efficiency of the way we are conducting our agri-food system. So it's very inefficient. Uh, for example, if we talk about trade, WTO says that any commodity cross the border at least twice. So you could be a country that produces potato, it goes across the border somewhere with all the carbon and all the environmental footprint, and maybe it becomes chips and it comes back to your country. So there's a huge inefficiency in the trade, for example. There is a huge inefficiency in the way we are producing. So we are producing with too much inputs. And this is because for the longest time, we were taking natural resources for granted. We didn't really pay attention to the water footprint, fertilizer footprint, and so on and so forth. And it is also, if we look at 
the inequalities in the agri-food system, they are tremendous. Now that we are looking from the gender lenses, we can find data that showcase that when you have hungry in any community or any region, you will find women that are much more fragile than men, and hence the number of women that are hungry is much larger. You find really a lot of inequalities in terms of underrepresented communities. So in, a, in, in the grand scheme of things, it's broken because it's not nourishing us. It's broken because it's part of the climate crisis. So 30% of the emission of greenhouse gas comes again from the agri-food system. And it is broken because we haven't been able really to use agriculture to uplift people from poverty. And there is data that shows again that the best way really to end hunger and poverty is through agriculture, because we have a large number of rural communities that are working in the sector, and they require really, they require a lot of help when you talk about ending hunger and reducing inequalities and poverty. Let me um, focus on that seven, eight, 780 million people. That's a huge number of people going to bed hungry. Um, I was reading an article, and maybe, I don't know if this is correct, but the world is producing enough food, they say, and yet millions of people are still suffering from hunger and going to bed hungry. How worse can it get with climate change? So what we are saying is that the situation is going to get worse as the global warms. So for every half degree more, or even 0 0.1 degree more, we will see a huge number. So our number says that by if we get to the scenario of two degrees, we have about 189 million more people hungry. If we get to the four degree, we will have 1.8 billion people hungry. So it is definitely a huge problem. And particularly, it's not only the, the temperature, it's very important and it's very crucial. And the reason why the temperature is very important in the agriculture is just to give you examples. Uh, when we talk about water evapotranspiration, so the plants, the, the way the photosynthesis work is that the plant takes water and then there is an evapotranspiration. As the metabolism works in the plant, they evapotranspirate. So with a higher temperature, you will have higher evapotranspiration in plant, which means you need more water for the plant. So the plant will require more to produce the same thing. For example, the other, most of the, the cycle of the plant and animals, as a matter of fact, it's very much um, regulated by the photosynthesis, how many days, how much light you have, and the temperature. So with one degree more, or 1.5 degree more, I think, 50% of the maize in Africa will fail to flower completely. So the fact that our agri-food system, it's so dependent on the envir environment, so dependent on ecosystem, makes it super, super fragile to the temperature, to the water, and to other natural resources. And that makes it really that it's a sector that, yes, part and parcel of the emission, but it's also a sector that nourish people. I always say, I definitely can survive without a phone or without a TV, but I cannot survive without food. All of us, we need that food. But it's also a sector that sequesters a lot and we are not recognizing it. So the fact that I always say carbon sequestration, when we talk about where does the carbon store? It's in soils, it's in water, and it's in plants, not only trees, even in your annuals, even in your perennials. So the sequestration capacity of the sector is huge. We are not yet using it properly. So maybe if we calculate the sequestration, we wouldn't be only net carbon. We could be, we could be sequestering more than emitting, and we will be in the minus. We will be part and parcel of the solution. And the way we are not doing it is mostly methodologies and capacity to really calculate how much the, the sector is sequestering. But I am a big believer that it has to be central in the climate crisis and in adaptation and mitigation of, of, of to climate change because the sector is the only one that's sequestered to start with. And that sequestration capacity, we need to calculate it, quantify it, monetize it, pay for it to the farmers that produce food. But also, we could continue to find better methodologies to increase that, that the, the carbon 
that sequestration capacity and move to a better practices, more sustainable, more resilient, to, again, sequester much more than what we are sequestering right now. Are you looking for the inside story on what's happening at organisations like the World Bank, USAID or the Gates Foundation? Then you need to be reading DevEx Pro. I'm Jessica Abrahams and I'm the editor of DevEx Pro. Pro is DevEx's premium news subscription, where our expert reporters and analysts take you beyond the headlines, deep into the trends and institutions shaping the $200 billion aid industry. As well as all our news, you'll get access to conversations with global development leaders, resources to help you grow in your career, and a subscriber-only newsletter full of insider news and tidbits. See for yourself by getting a free trial today at devx.com slash pro. How does that feed into your priorities, you know, as uh, director of CGIR, um, some of your research priorities? It's, it's, it's a high priority. So we have, it's a very big priority for us because... Uh, See, we work mostly for the least and middle income countries. Uh, I always say we work mostly for the small scale farmers in least and income uh, countries. And those farmers, we have seen them through all the crises. They are, again, the people that get really burned by any crisis, particularly when we talk climate, but also other kind of crisis, be it security or be it other kind of crisis. So for us, Climate adaptation, we have been talking about it for the longest time. Because when you talk about climate adaptation, it's a very long-term plan. So when we talk about genetics, you need to breed the crops for plus two. You need to, to breed the crops for plus three. You need to diversify your portfolio because we know that by having monoculture, we are really, again, increasing the fragility of the farmers. So there is a lot of plans that you need to put in place, and particularly on the breathing side, it's something that's going to take a long time. So we have been in the climate change adaptation, um, let's see, programming for the last 20 years, but really going forward with all these data that we are gathering, we are really very, very worried. And hence, we need to invest more in science, we need to invest more in innovation, but we need also to invest more in sharing data, in sharing technology. There is a lot of things that we are missing by not sharing data together and having a, a, a bird view on what's happening. And that's where for us, both the breeding on crops, on fish, on animals, it's very important, but also everything around water management, given the scarcity of water, but also natural resource management and other, and looking at how could we put a, an innovation ecosystems, how could we help countries to really pick up much better innovation and put SMEs, private sector, public sector, all players on the ground so that we can move from 125 plant species and few animal species to maybe a system that embraces biodiversity, that addresses much more the need in terms of nutrition, that respects more ecosystems. So I, I always say the ecosystem it's like our organs. You can't ask the heart to play the role of a kidney. This is not, it's not meant to be like that. So ecosystem are best for certain species. And most of those species are local, actually. Most of those species are with the indigenous people. Most of the species our ancestors used to, to grow. But with the globalization and with, again, this inefficient trade that we have, we have been producing the same thing, and we have been squeezing our ecosystem to produce what we want, not what they can produce. So I think really our, when we talk about shift and agri-food system transformation, it's a transformation towards understanding nature better and asking from the ecosystem to produce what it's meant to produce, but then bringing technology, bringing innovation so that we have, we produce much more in terms of quantity, in terms of quality, by this ecosystem. And that's where a center like CGR that have about 9,000 employees has really the breadth of the number of scientists, of data over years. And we are really trying to use AI, big data, large partners to really get the data together 
and find the best agri-food system for every ecosystem. Agri-food system for every uh, ecosystem. I would underline diversification. I think when you talk, if you, wanna, if you have a little money, it doesn't matter how much you go to a financial uh, planner and he tell you diversify. So what we need to do is diversify our agri-food system. We should really stop producing too much of certain things and not think of many. And we need to do that again by respecting the data, the information, what we know, and by looking at the modeling, how the environment is going to be, so that they are, we, are, we are a little bit ahead of the curve. So diversification will be the most important. Thanks for listening to Climate Plus. If you enjoyed today's episode, please share it. And you can also leave us a rating or a review. We'll be publishing episodes twice a week in the lead up to, during, and after COP28. So make sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast streaming platform. If you want to share some feedback on this episode or have questions you'd like answered, we'd love to hear from you. Drop me a message on X, formerly Twitter, at Alter Igo, or send an email to podcast at devx.com. Climate Plus is a podcast from DevX. It's hosted by me, Michael Igo. Today's episode was produced and edited by Naomi Miara.